Hello, everyone, and welcome from Johannesburg. What you have before you is the second webinar of the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Classes inaugural Global Blackness Summer School, Creole Miami, Quotidian Entanglements of the Americas with Donette Francis. I'm Victoria J. Collis Butelezi, the Center's Director. Before I hand over to Donette, I will give you a sense of how the webinar will work and tell you about our center and its Global Blackness Summer School. I will then be honored to introduce Professor Donette Francis. So first off, to ask questions, you have two options. You may use the Q&A function to pose questions, and this you can do throughout the webinar, though we will only turn to these during the Q&A section or session of the webinar. The other option is to raise your hand. So use the raise hand function during the discussion section of the webinar. That is once Donette has finished her talk and we will then unmute you so that you may speak out your question for yourself. While the chat will remain open, we ask that you use it for greetings across the interwebs rather than questions it is, as it is harder for us to keep track of questions in the chat. So either post in the Q&A over the course of the talk and I read out your question and, or comment on your behalf once we get to discussion or raise your hand during the Q&A and we'll unmute you so that you can ask your question. RGC is an interdisciplinary center at the University of Johannesburg launched a little over a year ago through the support of the university's leadership. This year's Global Blackness Summer School is our first and thus a moment of celebration for the center, as well as the University of Johannesburg. Based in the humanities faculty, RGC brings together a diverse community of scholars, artists, activists, and more around race, gender, and class from a uniquely South African, Pan-African, and Southern Hemispheric orientation. An annual gathering, this year's summer school, entitled Black Articulation Otherwise has been made possible by funding from the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences and the University of Johannesburg. We use the term global blackness here to attend to the ways in which black life exists across the globe, but is not always the same experience. Shaped by locatedness or articulation to think with Stuart Hall, urban, rural, now, then, north, south, male, female, gendered, gendered, refusing. Blackness exists on and in multiple space times. Hence our theme this year, Black Articulation Otherwise. Our aim through the Global Blackness Summer School is to open shared moments of experimentation, feeling and thinking, doing around what it means, meant, or could mean to be Black. Today, I have the honor of, we have the honor of thinking through and from the particular location of Miami as a space of black formation in relation to what Donette Francis has called Creole hemispheric whiteness. Donette's invitation seems to be to think from a space time that is shaped by specific racializations beyond the hegemonic story that one nation state tells about itself. Donat Francis is co-director for the Center for Global Black Studies and past director of the American Studies Program at the University of Miami. An associate professor of English and founding member of the Hemispheric Caribbean Studies Collective, Donat specializes in Caribbean literary and intellectual histories, American, Im American immigrant literatures, African diaspora literary studies, globalization and transnational feminist studies and theories of sexuality and citizenship. Professor Francis is author of Fictions of Feminine Citizenship, Sexuality and the Nation in Contemporary Caribbean Literature. She's currently working on two book projects, one of which speaks directly to her talk today, Creole Miami, Black Arts in the Magic City, a sociocultural history of Black arts practice in Miami from 1980s to the present. Dr. Francis is co-founder of the Jamaican Cultural Political Modern Project, which convenes symposia and publishes essays that rethink Jamaica's historiography. 
Essays from the Proceedings on the Jamaican 1960s and the Jamaican 1970s are published in Small Acts, a Caribbean Journal of Criticism. Professor Francis is also a research associate with the Center for the Study of Race, Gender, and Class at the University of Johannesburg. Join me in welcoming Professor Donette Francis. Thanks, Victoria, <clears throat> for having me. Um, so good day is now my Zoom mode of address since time travel seems to be the most certain thing about our new pandemic lives. I honor the ancestral and contemporary power and struggles of the Tequesta, Seminole and Mistisuki peoples in Miami by acknowledging the sovereignty and solidarity embodied by their unceded territory. I want to thank Professor Victoria Colas Butelezi and the Center for Race, Gender and Class at the University of Johannesburg for the invitation to talk about my work in progress and for the opportunity to have engaged in such impactful critical listening around traveling theories with the participants in Monday's session. I'd also like to thank Sethambenta Ma Kanga, and I messed that up, sorry, Ryan Bruton, um, Nikki Spalding, and James McDonald for all the background work that they've done to make this engagement possible. So I thought what I would do today is to triangulate time, place, um, as time and place as they are entangled with broader questions of race and ethnicity to illustrate what a reading of Black Miami arts um, rooted in the experience of the city offers contemporary theory. This approach is in line, I believe, with what, the, with what Victoria just outlined for us about their center's vision, which thinks the many articulations of global blackness that exist in multiple time space across the globe. Indeed, I would add that each time space allows its own insightful detour. And so today we're gonna detour to Miami where my work, Creole Miami, make, takes its methodological injunction and conceptual sensibility from the late anthropologist Michelle Ralph Trujillo, who nearly three decades ago insisted that theories of Creolization should not be theories of a totality, but rather should make foundational to its analysis the historical conditions of cultural production by attending to what went on in specific places and times to produce a framework sensitive, sensitive enough to time, place, and power. What I will share with you today are selections from a multidisciplinary archive of Black Miami artists that allows me to assemble the mid 20th century history of Black Miami. Poignantly, this art moves from what we might call an ethnographic mode in the 1960s and 1970s, as it renders the dynamic streetscapes of historic black neighborhoods such as West Coconut Grove. Oops, I'm sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Uh, one sec. Okay, so. So, right, so what I will share with you today are selections from a multidisciplinary archive of Black Miami, Black Miami artists uh, that allow me to assemble a mid 20th century history of Black Miami. Poignantly, this art moves from what we might call an ethnographic mode in the 1960s and 70s, as it rendered dynamic streetscapes, streetscapes of historic Black neighborhoods such as West Coconut Grove to now in our present moment, an archeological mode that documents through plant and tree life, the artifacts of what were once vibrant black neighborhoods amid rapid development, climate gentrification and displacement of black folks in places like Little Haiti and Liberty City. A central argument <clears throat> that the project makes is that migrations from the Americas into Miami and the interplay between multiple national racial formations reshape not only contemporary racial 
politics and power in this southernmost U.S. city, but it also reconfigures ethno-racialized borders of the Americas. Present-day Miami is often identified as a Latin city, and while it is, with 70% of its population from Latin America, it is equally important to underscore that it is the settled, that it is on the settled land of, <clears throat> of sacred indigenous territories, as well as the foundational black laborers um, from the Bahamas, Alabama, and North Georgia, who were pivotal to the city's incorporation and whose laboring bodies built this city. Even while this is devalued, such a trace understanding of the Black and Indigenous absent presence is legible to city inhabitants. As the imperial crossroads of the Americas in contemporary Miami, the legacies of segregationist Jim Crow practices converge with transplanted racial ideologies and hierarchies from the city's current 93% foreign born population from the Caribbean and Latin America. As a minority majority city, Latinos of any race make up 70% of the population where only 3% identify as black Hispanics. This leaves the remaining 67% moving between white and mestizo. This identification suggests that migrants bring their own tripartite mestizo racial formation from their Latin American and Caribbean countries of origin um, that has shifted racial politics over time. The dominant story about race and Miami centers what I term hemispheric Creole whiteness, a racial formation that foregrounds the city's decisive post 1980s Latinization when white Hispanics gained and have retained significant power within the city's civic, political, financial, and cultural infrastructures. Even when there is a focus on acquiring US citizenship and its intending voting rights as key sites of power, deep transnational ties to countries of origin matter consistently. This shift in citywide governance and countenance stands in sharp distinction to the more typical entrenchment of Anglo white power in other US cities. Importantly, however, in Miami, white Latinness is more creolized, more mixed, and therefore the boundaries of this Creole whiteness are more porous. This more flexible non Anglo American whiteness accounts for why the twinning of race and ethnicity is used to negotiate the most mundane of everyday encounters. The attending citywide logic is, if another kind of whiteness, a hemispheric Creole whiteness is in power, then how can I, or then how can ethnic identity vis-a-vis um, -vis national affiliation be, mobil be mobilized to gain proximity to power? One important consequence of the diversity and perver pervasiveness of white Latino power in Miami is that it, it's often hard to realize meaningful solidarity between the city's black and brown residents, despite their shared economic precarity. Where whiteness has creole, creolized contours, so does the spectrum of blackness that has its own internal rankings and intraracial resentments, so that blackness that have a prior relationship to places outside of Miami-Dade County is privileged over native Miami Blackness. Thus understanding Miami lays bare that <clears throat> it is not only the US state producing racial subjects through the census, for example, but also that migrants bring and produce new structural hierarchies that govern quotidian encounters. The everyday effect of this particular demographic density, identifications and disidentifications from the regional Caribbean and Latin America effectively creolizes the lived realities of both white, whiteness and blackness. And at once reveals other social and linguistic formations as well as the promises and the pitfalls of state multicultural projects. I use sediments 
as I use sediments as a metaphor to think about Black life in Miami, where the proximity and compression of Black Miami tells a more hemispheric story. Borrowing from marine sciences, I turn to an ecosystem where water, mud, and land are indistinguishable and the possibility of one's very movement is encumbered by sedimentation, which includes the material refuse that floats atop. Sedimentation is itself a process that comprises mixing and layering with a keen awareness that the mixing between the layer of the, the mixing between the layers themselves. So sediments as a metaphor for black life in Miami recognizes these stratified layers where the top layers have access to more oxygen and settled matter be, can become catalyzed by elements such as strong winds and the waves of hurricane. At its most stark, sediments delimit the possibility of life because it denies it oxygen. Yet sediments are also altered by each tidal wave, bringing in new generations of migrants in this instance, suggesting a, palim a palimpsest of geographies and identities overlaid with the traces of earlier histories sediment in the present. Thinking about the plurality of blackness through the metaphor of sediments retains the histories of even those marginalized bodies in the contemporary city cityscape while also drawing attention to both the mixed and layered traces of black ethnicity, which are always on or just below the surface and never wholly subsumed by an undifferentiated, settled or uncontaminated idea of blackness as the sole identity marker. In the time that remains, I want to stitch together the work of four artists that span from 1969 to the present <clears throat> to sketch a, a history of Black Miami and its various neighborhoods. Or as the historian and, My and Miami native Tara Hunter puts it, this polyglot Black city. In making Black Miami the subject of their artwork, these artists self-reflectively engage the history of their respective time and places. So what you have in front of you here is a map of the institution in which I work and how it dot the various um, Black neighborhoods throughout Miami-Dade County. And one of the things that you'll see that's perhaps more pronounced is that especially when we're looking at um, the medical centers, they are all in the heart of a downtown Miami, which then is also the heart of Miami's black neighborhoods. But when we move a little closer to the south, um, where you see I have the, the Coral Gables, Gables campus, then you see Miami's relationship the, my, the campus that I work on every day, its relationship to the Southern neighborhoods that we think less about, that's also a part of um, how we understand Black Miami. So the self-trained artist Purvis Young is perhaps one of the most famous visual artists to emerge from Miami. His work that used demolition materials and other scraps tell the story of the tragic displacement of Overtown residents with the building of I-95 in the 1950s. Unfortunately, it also tells a darker story about Black artists and the art market, where from as early as the Harlem Renaissance, speculators and patrons profited at the artist's expense. Though less visible, other, <clears throat> other other Black artists working during the period are important to the story of Miami. In fact, the Miami Black Arts Workshop, which emerged out of the context of Jim Crow segregation and a history of the late integration of Black students in my own institution, the University of Miami, which began accepting Black students in 1961, is relevant to the story of Black arts infrastructure of the period. So as an important aside and to also situate myself, 
<laughs> I should say that every day when I walk into the Ash Building um, that houses the office of the, the, the president of the university, as well as the provost and the arts and science faculty of which I'm a member, I'm confronted with this picture of the 13 black pioneers. And while this image is relatively small in scale, I am reminded every day that I work um, in the wake of Jim Crow. So these are the first grad black graduates of Miami. So this is 61 when they first enter and the story that begins with Roland Woods at the University of Miami um, in 1969. So Roland Woods was a founding member of the Miami Black Arts Workshop. In 1969, while students at the University of Miami, Woods along with four other UM students received a clarion call, as they called it, um, from the renowned choreographer, dancer, and anthropologist, Catherine Dunham. Woods recounts that Dunham was in residence at the Four Ambassadors Hotel on Miami Beach where she was commissioned to perform and lecture at the annual conference for the Florida Arts Council. Disappointed by the lack of local Black audience members and Black representation in the arts, Dunham reached out to the University of Miami's art department and set up a meeting with students. She challenged them to mobilize, quote, their intellectual environment with a wealth of resources to stimulate art and culture in their nearby minority communities. Accepting this mandate, the Art Collective was born and made the underserved Black heritage neighborhood of the West Grove its main workstation given its proximity to their affluent white Coral Gables campus. Similar to the various social arts justice and arts initiatives in Black communities across the U.S. during the period, the lesser known Miami Black Arts Workshop ran from 1969 to 1975 and operated several outreach programs for children as well as a prison arts program which engaged inmates and showcased their creative writing and artwork. Woods is more recognized for his geometric forms infused with both political and spiritual themes. His 1967 Pitts and Lee print memorialized the wrongful conviction of Freddie Pitts and Wilbert Lee, two black men imprisoned for the 1963 killings of two white men without evidence to support this conviction. While a white man confessed to the crime in 1966, it took until 1975 for Governor Florida Reuben Askew to, part, to issue a pardon. And it's interesting to sort of think about this in light of the contemporary news that we're hearing here in the US. But here I wanna draw our attention to Wood's lesser known um, 1969 observation series where in his artistic portrayals of the streetscapes of, West, of the West Grove, there is an insistence on the sensuousness of black, public, of black presence in public as enactments of freedom. Having lived in the West Grove from 1969 through the mid 1970s, Woods walked the neighborhood with his sketchbook and drew as he recounts, what I saw and felt, the visual images before me. Where the quotidian inspired his use of muted, muted watercolors unsettled expectations of the intense tropical colors associated with Miami. Alternatively, he employed subdued tones within his palette of watercolors and activated sidewalks and streets as stages alive with black movement in the mundane yet sensorial performances of everyday life. Woods's black sensorial bodies are drawn in muscular forms and rendered in voluminous shapes that fill up the breadth of the picture frame. These sketches carefully attend to bodily poses, gestures, and facial expressions. Men with arms akimbo challenge prescribed gender norms Women's voluptuous curves are elevated to Rubenesque shapes. 
that appreciate the fullness of the female form. Facial expressions range from elation and flirtation to castigation. And even when figures are illustrated from behind, they are in counterposed positions of dynamic twist to depict not only their relational conversations, but also their social inhabitants of the street. Wood's observation series therefore illuminates the black side of Grand Avenue as a black public square composed of black owned businesses such as barbershops, bars, and grocery stores as visibly named subjects in his compositions. His streetscapes teeming with black public gatherings and commerce sketch the fullness of the West Grove's black sociality through an ease of a non-surveilling assembly that portrays the pleasure, pathos, and sense of, of community amongst its residents. Furthermore, his detailed depictions of sidewalk port, sidewalk port scenes disrupt demarcate, demarcations of interior and exterior to convey how activities in, pub, in private spill out until the, onto the public connoting the fluidity between labor and leisure in this mixed class black community. Featuring port sitters watching and engaging passersby in conversation, his compositions create a dialectic between the watcher and the walker, paying careful attention to seeing and being seen. As a study in watercolor, Woods's observation series is an invaluable visual art archive that expresses the everyday beauty and vitality of the Black Grove re residents. His muted palette did for West Coconut Grove of the 1960s and 70s what Archibald Motley's vibrant colored paintings did for Chicago's Browns Bronzeville neighborhood of the 1930s and 40s. Notably, Motley's vivid oil paintings infuse radiant light to depict interior spaces such as jazz time night venues and churches. By contrast, making use of his environment's natural lighting, Woods, Woods subdued watercolors depict people outdoors. This built in luminosity renders the ordinary and mundane activities and people encountered on the streets of the Black Grove where through the 1980s, a substantial number of artists lived and worked. If Motley staged exuberant, even exaggerated portrayals of Bronzeville during the Great Migration, then Woods's more serene palette engenders quiet meditations on the freedom of Black movement in segregated spaces in spite of his persistently Jim Crow time and place. As Roland Woods made art and artistic community in West Grove, Juana Valdez, a seven-year-old Black girl, arrived in Miami on one of the last freedom flights from Varadero Beach, Cuba, into Miami in 1971, nine years before the 1980 Mariel boatlift. In the dominant narrative about race and late 20th century Cuban migration into the US, it was with this 1980 Mariel boat lift that a more visible black presence emerged in sharp distinction from the earlier waves of white Cuban refugees. The, Valdez, my, the Valdez's family migration story disrupts this well-worn well tale. Even as she's often wrongly hailed, even by her Cuban co-ethnics as having arrived with Mariel. Images of the sea, shorelines, and the non-figurative have been central to Valdez's art practice. And I wanna highlight her most recent 2020 <clears throat> installation, Rest Assured, Stage in Miami, which features the waterways between Cuba and Miami a simultaneously a culmination of and departure from her existing body of work. Even as it is her most narrative driven work to date, Valdez refuses to picture bodies lost at sea, as we know occurred during Mariel and other treacherous sea voyages. 
in this way, she, can, she continues to work in the mode of what I call the abstracted intimate, where the non, where non-figurative art is imbued with meaning to tell intimate stories of loss, displacement, and living. In this site-specific installation, Valdez brings the force of her critical visuality to explicitly scrutinize the migratory history of her Cuban co-ethnics and Miami's very local and distinctive project of racialization. Created in uh, 2020 against the backdrop against anti-immigrant and worldwide refugee crisis, particularly in Europe, South Central America, and the United States, Valdez sought to intervene in these dominant debates. For that reason, she asserts, quote, I wanted to function in the same medium that was projecting this history, these images into the world, so it had to be video, end quote. Consequently, three different video narratives play in three demarcated gallery spaces as Valdez directs the order in which the gallery viewers encounter and process the work. When viewers walked into the entrance hallway of the Locust Project Gallery in Miami's Midtown Arts District during the politically charged 2020 fall election season, they immediately encountered wall text to the left and the right. The subject heading to the left read, history of assistance to Cuban immigrants, followed by a timeline from 1959 to, two, to 2014, recording legislative acts that provided various kinds of resettlement assistance, as well as pathways to US residency and citizenship. The subject heading to the, of the right wall text read, quote, facts on Hispanics of Cuban origin in the United States. And it detailed rates of home ownership, fertility, marital status, and top states of residence, which revealed their 66% concentrated presence in Miami versus other US cities. In all these indicators, Cubans performed more favorably than other Hispanic groups. Engaging multimodal forms, Valdez moves between affective registers as the wall text of empirical data from the Pew Research Center interrupts our watching of the television images. The, in the installation's final video, Valdez probes what it feels like to be adrift at sea. Rendering a womb-like sonogram of the sea's fleshiness, our eyes are trained to simultaneously see the ocean as a space of birth and death, visibility and invisibility, as well as a space of ghostly presence and haunting absence. Because the installation takes as its inspiration or takes its inspiration from the tragic Balseros passages of the 1990s, it places Cubans in relation to Atlantic and, and the Middle Passage, regardless of the racialized non-Black identity they have acquired or assumed due to, due to benefits received. Beckoning her co-ethnics to empathy, in particular Black empathy, the installation presumes a shared awareness among her co-ethnics of the thousands of Cubans, Black, Brown, and White, who lie at the bottom of the ocean at least since 1994, if not earlier. With the sonic waves of the sea, rest assured transports viewers and interprets the shoreline as a discriminating border wall that interdicts and sends some migrants back home from the seas or rescues and welcomes others into the US shores or onto the US shores. The differential reception of Haitian versus Cuban immigrants are etched into the everyday memories among the city's old and new, new residents. With this project, Valdez searches for visual forms to communicate the power of the well-rehearsed local immigrant story cast in an urgency of a political present that insists on thinking together anti-immigrant and anti-immigrant and anti-black sentiments and politics. Her work materializes even as it disrupts 
the idea that rest is assured, that it ensures futurity or establishes a firm footing on land. None of these assumptions are true for immigrants, but especially so for Black, immigrant, female bodies cast off as dissonant and out of time and place. Viewers are three minutes into the video before witnessing the first object afloat, which is then followed by a litter of other personal effects. Book bags, <coughs> suitcases, jelly shoes, a teddy bear, a purse, a soccer ball, and the life vests that didn't save the human bodies that are nowhere to be seen. The longest cinematic dwelling, however, is on the dress. And viewers sit with this dress for 25 seconds. Delicate and light and otherworldly, the image resembles a womb-like sonogram. This arresting visual plunges viewers into the life world of the would-be wearer. And we're invited to ask, what were her dreams of things to come? What did she imagine on the horizon, on the other shore? Recall that Valdez's aesthetic commitments refuse to represent dead human bodies at sea. Instead, their loss of life is visualized only through their personal effects. 10 minutes and 47 seconds into the video, the sound of people can be heard in Spanish, in English, and through laughter. Viewers are privy to hearing a world in which beachgoers are unaware of the day's unfolding tragedy, where many people lost their lives in attempt to seek refuge on US shores. This moment is also about the tra tragic loss of kin made visible through their property that litters the beachscape, but is unseen as people go about their everyday lives. Pos this positioned as omniscient spectators, viewers know, however, that waves washed debris, debris ashore and the sanitation workers will clean the beach by morning, erasing all the material personal effects of these bodies lost at sea. The unseen, these unseen bodies remain nonetheless, living sediments on the ocean floor, ghosting these tragic contemporary crossings with the earlier middle and other Atlantic passages. Disrupting Miami's celebrated diversity and a branding as a city of the future, Rest Assure reckons with questions of equality, barriers to justice, and routes to meaningful inclusion. The personal and professional risk-taking that Valdez undertook with this exhibition, especially because it's funded by um, local Miami um, institutions, um, so the, the risk taking that she takes um, in this politically charged moment amplifies the work's significance. Thus, while Rest Assure's critique has universal resonances, its ideal audience, I maintain, in the language of racial reckoning, is Miamians as it exposes waves of the city's racialized refugee time and its intendant local power structure. Lingering on place, pace, character development, and tonal composition, film is Farron Humes' preferred medium to tell issue-oriented stories about underserved Black communities. Film, she tells us, gives me three years and I can take my time to collaborate with, con with communities. Constitutive of her practice, this cinematic aesthetic of what I am calling slow time works against the capitalist logic of metricized time to produce other ways of being in time and distinct methods of film production. In Humes's film, slow time makes visible how the accretions of invisible long-standing harms, what um, Rob Nixon calls slow violence, plays out in black communities. 
her films slow down to mourn Black death, imposing the Black gaze and drawing attention to light and lighting Hume constructs dense portraits of sisterly and communal love that detail the sacrifices, silences, and slights one endures to create and sustain kinship ties against all odds. A cinematic practice deeply wedded to the visual arts, Hume's use of the camera liberates the Black gaze to render the Black South and Miami as part of um, and, and Miami as part of the Black South and the Global South in its full complexity, rather than perceptions of underdevelopment or stereotypes. The dwelling lingering aesthetic of slow time in Humes's short films offer possible pathways out of the slow violence of Black death. Humes served as the production manager in Terrell Alvin McCraney and Barry Jenkins' 2017 Oscar-winning film, Moonlight. In the midst of scouting Black Miami locations, Humes found herself in the midst of construction in Liberty Square, the oldest housing project in the Southeastern United States. And then she says, when I would talk to people, no one had answers. And there was a distance between the lawmakers and the commissioners and the actual residents. I was interested in this divide and in the question, who has the answers? Who has the knowledge? And where is the agency for the residents? And in this situation, what does agency even look like? They started in the middle of my block too. Now I might as well just leave. Call me to try out. Liberty opens in the late afternoon light with the sounds of Black girlhood play, dancing to the song of peanut butter jelly. The camera cuts to our main protagonist, Milagros Gilbert, called Loggie, who watches the construction of the new apartment block to be called Liberty Rising, being built to replace the existing Liberty Square housing project. In the next frame, Loggie sits in front of her apartment, number 6241. The apartment number is deliberately shown to mark her place. She sits with a memorial of teddy bears, candles, and a picture of an adult woman whom spectators come to re realize is her deceased mother. This scene lingers without explanation and corresponds to Hume's intentional choice to allow a general audience to catch up while, as she puts it, locals get it, get it. Community, community members, the filmmaker explains, know what a memorial is. They live through it. They see it all the time. I didn't need to explain. 
Instead, Hume offers scenes of quiet, soundless portraits. One minute and 20 seconds into this 16 minute short film, the words are uttered, the first words are uttered by Loggie's friend and foil, Alexandra Jackson. They started in the middle of my block too. Instantly viewers understand that the story being told is one of residents being displaced from their homes as existing structures are gutted and newer buildings are erected for which the current occupants will need to apply to a lottery. Unfolding with documentary like realism, the narrative follows Loggie over a few days where viewers are privy to the adultification of black girls. We're in the midst of unsurmountable loss and vulnerability, resilience is marshaled. Liberty implicitly poses a series of questions. What will be the fate of the residents of this housing project as the gentrification of once neglected black communities that sit nine feet above sea level are now prime sites for climate gentrification? Centering the film around Loggy and the very question of liberty, Hume poses an even more intimate question. Given Loggy's fundamental loss of kin and impending housing displacement, where will she live and who will take care of her? Hume's slow lingering cinematic aesthetics compel viewers to ask, what are the costs of the ubiquitous popular media circulation of black girl magic and implicit resilience at the expense of black girl vulnerabilities? And what does it mean to hold all that grief? Dance directs movement in the film. Understanding the dancing body as an agential body, Hume tells us any movement was done with dance movement, everything else was stillness. Dance scenes demarcate the multiple audience for whom the girls dance and prompt a deep engagement with not only what constitutes the black gaze, but also multiple black looks and black audiences. The film opens with everyday dance among members of their housing block, where we see dance as play. And in the first dance, spectators are plunged into the community courtyard as a group of young residents watch and knowingly participate in the seemingly spontaneous, though well choreographed dance performance. Dancing for themselves, their athletic bodies push against the gentrification around them. The camera cuts to black. Loggie watches the ongoing building construction and, it, and Alexandra invites her to go to dance tryouts. Where dance direct directs the film movements, stillness conveys the story and the community stewards are its principal narrators who hold transgenerational community histories. These indispensable seers along with Loggie are the counter surveilling eyes juxtaposed against the surveyors hired by developers to take stock of what are in the apartments, even their refrigerators removing items and placing them in the in boarded up units. In the first still portrait, Loggie surveils what is happening around her and we see the memorial for her mother. Through their limited conversation, we learn that Alex's family is packing up to leave the following Monday. The film then closes with two full minutes of quiet as the girls return to a ritual of hair care practice that is repeated as an expression of love. There is no talking, words are unnecessary. Two minutes is a long time to impose this vision on an audience, especially when the film is only 16 minutes long. But through these care acts, viewers are instructed about what love and liberty look and feel like under conditions of loss. Despite the challenging circumstances of parental loss and housing displacement, in Liberty Hume's offers being with girlfriends as another way of being in community, in kinship. These lingering times together are efforts to keep Loggy in community rather than alone in her grief 
and to dwell therefore on the effective life world of young black girl subjects. Where Humes make films, film portraits, oops, sorry, um, about the displacement of black Miami residents, Morel Doucet makes portraiture of black subjects overlaid with the plant life of their black neighborhoods in the midst of gentrification. A visual archeologist of black Miami of sorts, his eco ecological drawings in the form of abstract portraiture of the, re of the residents gathers and repurposes the various flora and fauna from Little Haiti, Overtown, Alapata, and Liberty City. Doucet renders sacred time to honor the fullness of the people who live there. And he tells us, quote, in the event that these black bodies cease to exist with the threat of climate gentrification, the land we inhabit still holds our cultural memories and genetics. Tropical foliage and front yard gardens are, the, are like gatekeepers of time. They anchor the dreams and the hopes of the people. What then does the story of Miami have to offer contemporary theory? At the present juncture, it reminds us that to ask questions about racial formation is to make sense of the operations of power. The uncomfortable answer that Miami confronts us with is that when peoples from the Caribbean and Latin America gain access to citywide power in the United States, similar hierarchies and discriminations from countries of origin are reproduced, which make visible the persistence of the global reaches and practices of multiple forms, languages of white, and languages of white supremacy entangled with anti-indigeneity and anti-blackness. Yet, I am clean, keenly aware that even as I tell this story, the ground is shifting as new migration patterns from the Northeast and West Coast have emerged as a result of COVID-19 and migrants' desires to live in the US tropics. New and intensified speculation on real estate and the tech, in, the tech industries project a population of 7.5 million by 2040 in an already sinking city. Yet Miami's most consistent feature is that it is a city built on speculation and we need to keenly follow what new forms of racialization emerge in this hemispheric city with these new projected internal migrations. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Donette. I mean, you laid out so much for us. Um, and I, I almost want to, while folks kind of gather and, and offer their questions, I almost want to begin by asking you about where you, you, you landed, um, where you closed, closed off. I mean, so much of what you speak about brings to mind the stakes of thinking through very the, the texture or to use your terms, uh, the, 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 the sediments, the ways in which space um, and, and relation to space and life in certain spaces sediment and the implications and stakes of what happens. So just going to, to what you, you mapped out for us, I, in, in your closing, this question of how the multiple forms and languages of white supremacy, anti-indigeneity, anti-Blackness that come to bear in Miami. If you could speak to us about that and the, the question of futurity, because I, I think there's something so, um, 
you know, you pointed to people bringing discourses and modes and methods of racialization from elsewhere uh, to Miami, to the US, where there's often, we often have the kind of received notion that the US is white supremacy. And so what you had, um, when you spoke about Miami as, a, as disrupting Miami as a, 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 a celebratory multiracial city. So oh, thanks for that question. Um, what to say about Miami? Um, so I think what Miami um, does for me as a person who um, who who is a trying to make a life here, meaning live here. Um, but also what it means to make a life here as a black thinker and a black thinker that might um, acknowledge one's Caribbean roots is I think it just makes us deeply uncomfortable, right? Um, so, or, or it should. <laughs> um, so I think, um, if I were to simply celebrate as gets at, as people do celebrate the Caribbean-ness of Miami or the Latin-ness of Miami, um, maybe that would be okay, but it wouldn't be paying attention to another set of hierarchies that are afoot. And then I think not only to another set of hierarchies that are afoot, but that hierarchies that are afoot inside of all of the different categories. So I think nothing gets to stay stable. There is no valorization of what we might mean by Blackness or Caribbeanness or Latinness. What you get to see with the, and, and the reason why to me Miami matters is it's precisely because it's this intensity. It's a demographic intensity from the Americas that allows you to see how all of this stuff comes together and work itself out in ways that um, it's not easy to find a simple victor and a simple victim. It's not easy to identify who is solely the oppressor and the oppressed, right? And so it implicates um, us in these in, in 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 how we sit in relationship to these various axes of power. And to the extent that it does that, I think that it's very productive to think with. Um, because it unsettles all the things that we know or anything that we think we're comfortable in. And it's not to say that we all, that we haven't acknowledged elsewhere the failure of the multicultural project. But I think in other ways of languaging the failure of the multicultural project, it, it imagines it in still um, starkly binary terms, or it certainly doesn't allow you to think about um, when, when, when we are in classed positions of hierarchy, what do we do with it? Um, and so for me, um, Miami lays that bare. That is, so I, I just want to acknowledge um, appreciation from the comments. Thank you, Dr. Francis. This is a needed study as a theorist of and cultural worker from Miami. This is invaluable work. This is Jillian Hernandez, uh, especially as these histories of Black visual arts practices continue to be minoritized. Um, the, there's a question in the Q&A that I'm going to uh, uh, read out for you that I, 
I'll, maybe I'll piggyback on this, this uh, later, just to give other folks space. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the upcoming book project that this presentation helps us glimpse at? Uh, what is the role of critical Blackness in the tensions of the discourse of empowerment versus engaging with vulnerability? How do we creolize grief? Uh, this is from Manola Gayatri and um, uh, Kumar Swami. I'm just reading it over to make sure I understand all of its contours. Um, I almost want to understand a little bit more what the questioner means by what is the role of critical blackness in the tensions of the discourse of empowerment versus engaging with vulnerability and how do we I, I see them as two different questions and how do we creolize grief um do you want to ask manola to unmute yeah, yeah that would be great because I, I i'd like to hear what she's thinking uh, along those lines. Manola, are you here? Yes. Can I'm we here. ask you to unmute? Okay. Well, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. Um, I th so the tensions around the empowerment versus the, the vulnerability is um, actually drawing on your uh, reference to the Black Girl Magic. Um, and the space for vulnerability and grief and, and the way that tension is, is actually set up in what's offered as a path for the black radical or the critical black scholar. Um, you know, how to, yeah, how, to, yeah. So it's, it's related to that. And um, I think the question of realizing grief is to speak about the, the sort of multi, you know, the, well, racial creolization itself and the complexity of blackness seen through creolization and uh, the space for that kind of grief were vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis a certain um, a certain standard of what grief or blackness should look like. Yes. Um, so it's a in a sense it relates to. I don't know if it relates to intersectionality, but but it's it's something else. It's something more organic, and it comes from from the way creolize, creolization is being explored here. So, okay. So let me let me have a stab at part one of the question, um, and I'm going to restate it again: the critical blackness, um, as as you want to think about like black girl magic. And so part of part of what and, and, and I should just say, so maybe two quick things. So one one thing that I will say is that I am sort of the biggest ambassador for the the lesser known archive of Black Miami. And so Farron Humes is, I think, an amazing filmmaker. And that film that I showed, Liberty, is available online and I would encourage everyone to go see it. Um, um, so you just Google Farron Hume's Liberty and it comes up, you have immediate access to it. And to me, what's so, what's so profound about Farron's work is that she wants to sort of sit with the spaces of, of difficulty, right? So on the one hand, what you're seeing there's a way that I could walk away from that. Well, maybe not, but there's a way that you can embrace um, resilience. You can embrace um, how, how you can embrace the dance. You can embrace how they're moving through space. Like there's a way if, if I wanted to make this a romance about how these young women are surviving in, in spite of the odds, that story might be there to tell, but it's not the complex story that she's trying to, to, to really sit with in this film. And so I think that 
you know, what does it mean for her as someone who grew up um, not in Liberty Square, um, but surrounded by its cultural institutions, its Black cultural arts institutions, and to watch, and, and, and people in this city have long historical generation, intergenerational memories. So the story of Overtown and Black displacement, which is 40 blocks from Liberty City, is known, is lived, is felt um, viscerally in the city. So what does it mean to be on that film set? And I think the quieter story about um, Jenkins' Moonlight, right? Barry Jenkins and Terrell Alvin McCraney's Moonlight is that they spend, there is a commitment that when they have this opportunity to do for Miami's Black community, that's where they're going. They want to film in their, their um, school, their high schools. They want to film in their creative arts centers. Um, they want to bring in Black Miami filmmakers and production assistants and and local local um, untrained actors, right? Because there's a way that, as Farron would say, that they they get it, get it, they understand this story, um, and so, so, so that's my sort of romance about these filmmakers and how I'm so impressed with the work that they're doing in trying to tell these more layered stories of Black Miami that they feel, you know, sort of gets glossed over. Um, by let's say a South Beach aesthetic or a flat way of understanding Miami is underdeveloped or, uh, or Black Miami is underdeveloped or um, solely pathology. It's way more um, interesting. But in addition, right, these are spaces in which traumas are happening. And how do you live with those traumas? How am I going to tell this, the, the trauma of the current moment, which is one of displacement and gentrification, right? And so Farron is telling the, is, is making this film, which I think is going to, that she's working on making it a feature now, but she's telling this film as a response to her being in this place and documenting and holding accountable political officers, um, so politicians, and city commissioners, right? All the while trying to give a voice to black, to black girls, let's say in this instance, right? And there's so much happening in terms of the ways that they could be read, um, but she wants to, on the one hand, um, show their resilience, but is invested in showing their deep, their, their deep um, vulnerabilities. And what does it mean to sort of sit with that? What does it mean that by the end of the film, we have no idea what's going to happen to Loggy? And if you're an a, a empathetic critic, right, I think that that's what you have to walk away with. And so for me, um, what's so what what's so productive about this film is that a she sits with both, but that she leaves um, she doesn't it, she leaves it open ended right sort of the best plot it, she leaves it open ended for us to realize that there is there are no easy answers right and what you get are these two girls holding space for each other in the midst of um, this this vulnerability that Loggy is, especially is experiencing at this time. Um, and so creolize, so that might be a way of answering the creolizing grief too, right? Which is to say, it's, it's, it's not an easy answer. It's holding on to multiple things simultaneously. So we have, we have, uh, uh, Manola says, thank you. Yes, um, in, in the chat. So I, I think you, you more than uh, uh, answered that. Nicole Sarmiento. Uh, has asked, uh, thank you so much for this incredibly generous, beautiful presentation. I really love how you think through and with water and sediment, ecosystem, land in this, and making sense of the shifting ground that you describe. I wanted to ask what it would mean to maybe think of a space time like the Everglades as ancestor spirit of a place like Miami, particularly the long histories of resistance, fugitivity, 
and solidarities of those spaces in terms of multiple complex indigenous and African intimacies that have been actively erased, if that makes sense. Uh, so I'm, shall I read the other? Yeah, let me, let me try to answer this one um, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, and that is, that is on the one hand, the promise, the promise that the El Everglades could offer, right? Um, um, because you have to deal with um, the move, the, the actually you have to deal with the sovereignty of an indigenous presence that's still holding on to and laying claim to and trying to direct development in the Everglades, Everglades right? And you have a sense that um, when people move into this space or when people travel into this space, and I take that back from move, right? But when people travel into this space, the, the weighted history of, um, of an indigenous presence, the Mistasuki in particular, is very visible and very present. And so it's not as if you can um, think about um, this land theft as a thing of, of the past, right? To me, um, what becomes, and, and so you have lots of art initiatives that have collectives that go into the Everglades and spend a month there and try to think of what projects they can do together. And so all of that is there and it's possible, right? The limit that um, why we have to keep watching what's going on is that as we recognize that we're running out of space, the developers are looking to the Everglades, right? And so, and they're encroaching upon that space. And so we have to watch how that story unfolds. So on the one hand, I wanna say, yes, all of that is possible. And some of that work and, and a good bit of that work is being done now. And there's lots of activation and mobilization around say, you know, saving the Everglades initiative. Right, but what happens in our moment now with this new rapid um, development that's happening with the waves of migrants coming ostensibly from other parts of the U.S.? What's going to happen to the Everglades? So that's a that that's a part of the story that I that I'm watching, right? And so part of what why I ended where I did is because. The one thing that we know about Miami that's sure, which is not like it's different from other spaces, but speculation is the business of this city. And um, I, I, I'll just be curious to follow what happens with the Everglades and how long we're able to hold on to it and make it remain um, protected territory. Um, yeah, I... I'm going to pose Sibusiso's question, uh, and then maybe I'll, I'll pose a question about place and location in terms of, of what you've been saying about the Everglades, but also in relation to the hemisphere. So Sibusiso in Cambules asks, hi, just to slightly take you back to the previous sessions with Tavia, uh, Tavia Nyong'o, how can we think about creolization in light of Afrofuturism? Um, and maybe I'll, I'll let you answer that and then come in with my question about location. Okay. So, so, I mean, on the one hand, they could be compatible, um, but on the other, um, and so I'll go with the other part of it first, right? Um, so where, what they share is an attention to time and place, right? And where I think what Afrofabulation does is imagine a future that allows us to see ourselves outside of our present conjuncture, right? And I think that what I'm interested in with creolization is to really sit and dwell with the current conjuncture. So while I want to be aware of what could happen, um, I'm, I'm deeply invested in trying to make sense of um, what is 
and what's happening around me in this historical moment or the or or a past historical moment right so I can speculate what's going to happen in the future, and I think that that's the work of Afro Afrofuturism. But Afrofuturism is responding to right a lot of the crises of the present, and I think that we need really thick descriptions, if you will, of our current conjuncture. So I, I where you landed with um, your answer to that question, and I think the previous question really makes me want to ask you about, um, I'm thinking to your uh, uh, piece, uh, the introduction to the special issue on Black Miami, looking for Black Miami, uh, your 2020 uh, piece, where you speak about uh, Miami as Harlem of the hemisphere. And I, I'm, in part thinking, you know, at the back of my head is, I'm thinking with Nicole and her question and the Everglades and how Miami, I mean, maybe it's the, 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 the greater Miami, Florida region, which you do speak to in, in that piece as well, and how it sits within this kind of I don't know if you would call this, call it this, but the Creole Americas, right? The, the hemispheric Americas. If you could talk us through that kind of um, how Miami both, how we, we understand Miami with that appellation, which I, I think when I read that, it really, um, it shifted what I understood as Miami and what um, you were going to do with Black Miami. And it, it helped me rethink geographies and cartographies of Blackness. So if you could, if you could speak, speak to that because it's, yeah. Okay, so, so, one of the things that happens a, a good deal, especially around the cultural boosters of the city is um, because people are trying to find ways to make Miami register at whatever level that they're trying to make it register, they will say it's the crossroads to the Americas. It's the capital of Latin America. Um, and so for Black folks, it is the Harlem of the South, right? And so in calling it the Harlem of the South, they want to, you know, sort of give it a certain kind of cosmopolitanism, a space where culture is happening, a place, I mean, in, in conjuring Harlem, what they're really trying, what they're trying to do there is to think about all of the um, all of the um, the the cultural workers, the the performers, the athletes that have come to um, perform in Miami, right? So to say that Miami is um, a culturally rich space that um, I wouldn't say go to go so far as to say Harlem has nothing on Miami, but they're trying to aspire. To, to Miami being an uh, important site, an important cultural site of the black world. And I can see that, right? But part of what I was um, pushing towards in that piece um, or in that appellation, um, appellation, appellation is to think about um, how the US alone doesn't define Miami that Miami is equally defined by the hemisphere. So that if we're thinking about roots and routes of music, roots and routes of film um, and other cultural productions, you are looking further south, not necessarily further north, or you're looking at the zigzag between the north and the south. And so um, reframing it as the hemisphere is a way of sort of taking it out, taking it outside of simply a US frame to say that you have to understand it in relationship 
to the networks of everything else around it, right? So if you're in the Caribbean, um, the quickest way to get to Barbados from Jamaica might be through Miami, right? Um, and certainly the same thing if I want to get to Costa Rica from New York, right? Um, or if I want to go from Jamaica to Costa Rica, I'm going through New York, I'm uh, sorry, going through Miami. So it, it's a way of thinking materially just about like plane travel, but also how cultural travel, culture travels. And so that um, to, to limit Miami to the Harlem of the, of the South doesn't take into account its circum Caribbean, its America's location and orientation. And to do that then means that we have to think the Americas, think the Americas, uh, think the Americas and the hemisphere while not giving up um, the North, the North South, um, meaning North, Northern US South relationship. I would say some of the exciting work that one of my colleagues, um, Edmund Abaka is doing here at the University of Miami is he's beginning to map contemporary African migrations, like real, you know, contemporary African migrations into South Florida. So in this case, it's not, it's some Miami, but it might be for, um, points further north, such as Pompano Beach, Broward County. Um, and so um, to, 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 so, so, so in that way, you're getting a further Southern inflection. And the, the, the story is, or the, the point is to say that to understand the complexity of this space is to open up the borders of how we think the, think the US inside this place. The US is not the only, is not the only way to frame this place. And in fact, this place defies US framing defines I mean, a singular US framing, I would say. I mean, that is, uh, there's, there's another question that's come in that the extent to which what you are offering us is a way to think Miami in the hemisphere and black Miami in the hemisphere and informed by the hemisphere, but also the US formed by the dynamics of the hemisphere um, and where the US might be going. I, I want to ask you a, about that, but uh, Janine Jones has asked uh, a question um, and posted a comment. Uh, such a powerful, rich presentation, including your responses. Thank you so very much. And so now I'm thinking about your last response about Afrofuturism and sitting and dwelling with the current conjunction uh, or conjuncture. Do you think that when fabulating outside of a sitting and dwelling of the current conjunction, uh, we get imaginings that may be untethered from possibilities, whereas fabulating from the place of sitting and dwelling in the current conjunction may stand a better chance, at least epistemically, of being tethered to possibilities, even if they might be pessimistic. Thank you again. That's hard. That, that's, that's a hard answer because, so I'll, I'll say it from, I'll say it from the two places, the two US places that I know best. Um, I think I'm going to, I'm going to get pushed back on this, but I think I could dream an amazing black world from the space of Brooklyn. Um, I think, um, when I, when I, I see the richness of black life in Miami, but I also see the pathos of it, like the, the systemic, like I feel all of the Jim Crowness um, as, and the legacy of that as a path of my everyday, which is not to say that it makes it pessimistic. And this is me speaking from my own position, which is not to say that it makes it pessimistic, but I am confronted over and over again about um, the systemic Black exclusions, right? Um, and I think 
because Miami is founded in 1896, and so in the history of the UM might have a might have a a, a younger history, and because in this place you can see the possibilities for other folks to meet, remake a world in their own image. Um, and then to be persistently as a black person living here, seeing the limits of meaningful pathways to inclusion and, um, and resources, it, 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 it's really, really challenging. It's really, really challenging, which is not to say that people don't celebrate um, the ways in which they're able to, to, to maximize a life here. But I think that this maximized life is always in the shadows of what uh, is always in the shadows of systemic occlusions or systemic exclusions. Um, yeah, when you look at black neighborhoods versus other things that are just in other neighborhoods that are right next to it, you just look at the resources and it's just, it's, it's, um, it's hard. Certainly it's hard for me. And I would say though, I would say that, let, let me add one other thing to that. I would say that this looks different in Broward County that I'm talking about Miami-Dade County, and this looks slightly different in, in, in Broward County, where you might see more inclusion, um, um, more Black incorporation in terms of um, the very same kinds of infrastructures, political, cultural, um, economic, that I've identified that others have remade here in Dade County. You might see more of that in Broward County. It's just hard to see that in Miami. So we have, I think it's uh, two more questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to give you the one from the chat. Uh, I'll give you the one from the Q&A. And then I think um, I, I wanted to ask you about your, what does agency look like? But I, I think that speaks to what you were, you were speaking to just now, what agency looks like. And, black and brown solidarities um, from that space. Uh, Felix Mutunga says, thank you, Prof Francis, for this absolutely wonderful presentation. I love the metaphor of sedimentation and the different paths it leads us in thinking about processes of mixes, mixing and layering and how this also summons oceans, seas and waves. And this, these ideas of layering and mixing allow the continual remaking of black lives. But as you point out, they also mean the suffocation of what is layered on and the nourishing of other lives. Could you please speak more about these contradictions and tensions? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that in, in my answer to the last question, I, I, did, I did a bit of that work. Um, which is to say that it might be easier to sort of answer it after I'm trying to read what um, Nicole is saying about Little Haiti. Um, but it seems to me like we can point to the ways in which um, we can, we have had successes, we've remade spaces. Um, for example, Little Haiti, right? You see that. You see that as a space of resistance. You see that as a space where um, various kinds of communities can come together, right? But I'm also attuned to, we'll focus on, say, for example, um, the Little Haiti Cultural Center. And that's a city building, right? Like the city owns that property, which means that the city can take it away at any time, right? So yes, maybe there's there could be resistance and we could mobilize against that. Um, but during my tenure here already, I've watched the city take, you know, replace one of the managers to say, no, not you, someone else, right? So, so, so I see the space, I see how we, 
we listen, one of the things that's useful about that trio article, right, is to say that we remake life under the most difficult of, of circumstances. And the fact that we are still here is the miracle of creolization itself. And so I'm deeply attuned to that. Um, but um, I'm also aware because I hear it in, in, in the spaces that I inhabit from the community members that while they're, while they're able to um, enjoy the spaces they currently inhabit. And here I'm talking about the cultural and institutional spaces, less so, less so homes. Um, while they're able to make meaning in those spaces, um, they're also aware of its precarity and its tenuousness, right? So one of the things that, and I'll, I'll maybe end this, the answer to this question with this, with this, um, with this, with this example, um, I was talking to, um, I was talking to a cultural worker who was very interested out of town, but wanted to engage with Black Miami when they came to do programming in this city, right? As a mode of like, how can we recir recirculate these dollars in Black communities? And so her question to me was, um, is there a black, where's the black bookstore or is there a black bookstore? And the answer to which is no, right? There isn't one. There used to be one in Little Haiti, right? Um, that its focus was Haitian, book, Haitian books primarily, but it was our black bookstore. Um, so when I told this story to someone else, um, the last bookstore, the last black owned bookstore was probably 20 years ago. Yet this is multicultural Miami and we do have a fabulous annual book fair, right? And we're all welcome and we all participate. Um, but the circulation, and then I sound like a crazy like cultural nationalist, right? But the circulation of those dollars don't end up in black pockets, right? And these are the ways in which you see the systemic exclusions, right? In the moment of George Floyd, where everyone's trying to get black folks on their boards here in Miami and in, invite you to this and the other, you realize, and they now have to realize the systemic ways in which, you know, the branding of this city and the performing of this city and the building of this city's multiculturalism doesn't do anything for, for, for you know, it doesn't put money in black pockets. Uh, Danette, I just wanna, I know you you were reading Nicole's question and I think you, you responded uh, to it and responded to other questions with that in mind. Do you want me to read it out and uh, you, you speak to it or? Yeah, I, I didn't, I couldn't really read it. I just saw the, I saw Little Haiti. Um, so I, I can read it out for you. Um, and then we can, we can maybe treat this as, as our, your, our wrap up. Um, yes. Uh, so Nicole Sarmiento, thank you so much again for this discussion. I have one more question describe regarding what you describe around how race articulates itself in Miami. And that is also about how politics and racial formations align in really complex ways and what your ideas around this might be. In this, I am really thinking about how there are invisible lines drawn across Miami in terms of the kind of politics that can be articulated, especially as they often relate to Cuba and Cubans and Cuba's relationship to the US. For example, the history of radio stations, radio presenters being physically attacked, bookstores firebombed, Little Haiti has historically been a safe space for many political and aesthetic articulations as well as solidarities and what this means. Basically how your concept of Creole whiteness in many ways also has to do with aligning oneself to empire and in particular US imperialism in the Americas. Yes, 
Absolutely. So, um, so I answered a bit of that. And I think the only thing that I would add here is that the Cuban question is really um, um, a tricky one. And, and even amongst Cubans, right? And um, certainly generationally and politically. And part of what you get to understand when you move through the city and I move through certain institutions is that I realize one way of thinking about it is might be to think about what space is available for a progressive Cuban left in Miami. So, so that when the Cuban left tries to do certain kinds of activation, there are ways in which they get shut down. Um, or there are ways in which to do the work that they want to do, they have to do it um, out of sight so that they don't get shut down. And so the, the burden of what it means to be um, left-leaning, um, Cuban and trying to do progressive mobilizing is actually quite challenging in this city. And it's, and, and it's the most invisible labor. And so what's interesting for me is that someone like Juana, precisely because she's Afro-Cuban, can make those articulations. And there's a way that because she's already seen as an outsider, um, she has less to lose than those people who might be seemingly more embedded. So that's how I would answer that question. And I would say that what's interesting about, if you, if you think about the Cuban question, part of what happens, I would argue, is that Cuban in many, Cuba in many ways sets the table for how the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean is immigrants and wave of immigrants that come with um, a, a settled middle class first, that they're able to navigate and take and gain a foothold in the institutions in the city. And I think the same kinds of things happen to these other communities. And so the spaces in which you see the most dissent are actually the artistic spaces. And so I get to hear the dissent. Um, I get to hear the dissent amongst the artists and see it in the public sphere and in the academic context. I get to hear the dissent, but I will not see it in the public sphere, right? Um, and so that, that's, that's sort of the map of this place, the political map of this place. I mean, we didn't even, I, I guess we'll have to save this for when we have you back. Um, the question of black ethnicities and, and traversing those spaces. Uh, there's so many thank yous that have come in um, from Janine Jones, uh, Ayinsko. Uh, folks are truly appreciative for what you have put forth for us. And I think uh, we're all excited for the, the book. Um, you have really, you've helped us think through and understand in Miami in ways that maybe many of us have not considered or have been searching for a language um, for understanding. So we're ready for, for that manuscript. But you've also, as someone who thinks, um, has been thinking through space and location from a particular city, I think you've also, there are ways in which you've helped me. Um, and I think a lot of other folks think from place. So I want to appreciate you for that. There are many comments coming. Um, so can I just add, add, say one other plug? Because so a thank you Mabel for being here, but everyone needs to go read Jamima Pierre's essay in the Looking for Black Miami piece. It's a stunning um, life history about what it me what it meant to grow up in the eighties and nineties in Miami and traversing the various black geographies 
as a hate as a black Haitian that um, Jemima did. You have to go read um, that piece in um, Anthurium, looking for Black Miami. Uh, Jemima, can you put the title of the piece in the in the um, chat? It really, really is so good. So, so that special issue of looking for Black Miami, what I did was I invited Black academics who were from Miami, many of whom hadn't known each other before, to talk about Miami from their point of view and um, you know, their life history. And part of what I wanted to do is to put, you know, sort of put these keen thinkers like Tara Hunter and Jamima Pierre and Kevin Kwashi, like people who folks know in other contexts to think really critically and carefully about this space. Um, and it's a beautiful tapestry from sort of 1960 to the contemporary moment of what that meant to, to grow up in a place like this. So thank you. Growing, Growing up, up Black and Haitian and yeah, in Haitian and Black, a narrative in three acts. It's really, really good. And it's poetic. But it's also like, it's, it's what Trio asks us for, right? Like ethnographies that really make sense of a place. Uh, so Fel Jamima says, thank you. Um, Felix, uh, I, don't, I think this is a, a good place for us to wrap up. I'll read out the comment. Um, you can address it uh, as, as you wish. Uh, in continuation of this metaphor of sedimentation, in continuation of this also feels like power mute. It also feels like power mutates, metamorphoses, metamorphoses, metamorphosizes, reassembles, in layers, wave-like, and so we have sediments of power layered one upon each other in the face of descent. And so then this implies that vigilance should be at an all-time high. Thanks, Prof, once again. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria, for this occasion. This was really good. I enjoyed the engagement with everyone. And and I didn't realize Jamima was in the room. I have I have the biggest intellectual girl crush on her. I just think that I I admire her brain. She <laughs> and she helps me think about Black Miami. Yeah, she is amazing and phenomenal. As are you. Mm -hmm. um, I if if I may say so, Jamima Pierre. We're also honored to have her as a research associate. And Donette did not have uh, a small thing to do with that. She had a big thing to do with that. So I appreciate you both in the ways in which your minds work. Um, there's also a reading group that we had with uh, Jamima on racialization that you can find on the website. Uh, Tsepo says Tsepo Sherry says thank you, Donette. Your incisive lens has helped me consider the multiplicity of blackness from where I stand. Thanks, appreciation. And I am going to, Jimmy, I love the community you all have created. Thank you. Um, you have been such a big part of doing this work, Jeanette. So I'm so grateful that we got to be a space that could hear you present on Black Miami, on uh, hemispheric uh, Creole whiteness. And I just want to take this moment to thank everyone for joining us, to thank the RGC team, James McDonald, Sinetemba Makanya, Felix Mutunga, Olesegun Oluwoyo, Nandipa Svartboy, Sibusiso Nkambule, and Nozi Seranyane, who always bring their best, as well as our research associates and other partners. Uh, the English Department for its support, UJ's leadership, and the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. Our tech tonight and for the duration of the summer school is the work of folks at the National Arts Festival, Ryan Brutan, Brutan and Nikki Spaulding. Thank you to our attendees. And finally, thank you to Danette for your time, your brilliance, and collaboration. We cannot wait for that book. Uh, thanks, folks. Check out our website for more info on our Global Blackness Summer School. Week three's hybrid sessions will be at the Goodman Gallery with Gabrielle Goliath.
her new work Chorus and Pumla de Neocola, provisionally titled Wet Eyes as If Black Girl Freedom Has Come. Thanks folks. Have a great evening, morning, day. Much appreciation.